It's the world's most popular museum of modern and contemporary art. Five million visitors a year. Yet, only 20 years ago, it was just the shell of a defunct power station on the banks of the Thames. And now, Tate Modern has the Switch House, a 10-storey truncated folded pyramid clad in a perforated screen of over a third of a million bricks. It'll expand the museum by 60% with more galleries, education spaces and a panoramic terrace. It's the work of Swiss architects Herzog and de Meuron, designers of the original conversion which opened in 2000. The area around it has changed radically since then. What was once a post-industrial landscape with derelict wharves and warehouses interspersed with social housing has become prime real estate. Tate Modern has been a key driver in the regeneration and subsequent gentrification. At its heart is the turbine hall, the brooding cavernous volume once inhabited by the hulking machines and now transformed into arguably London's greatest internal public space. It's a descent into a resurrected, dark, subterranean underworld. This is a venue for art on an industrial scale. So Jack, here we are in the new extension to uh, Tate Modern. You started working on the building 22 years ago. Yeah. How does it feel to come back and extend your own building? That's a very psychological question because, um, as you said, 22 years is a lot of time in everybody's life. And when we were announced the winners, we were pretty young architects mm -hmm. and um, very excited to get started to work on such an amazing project. Yeah. And now, we, then later, we were in a different position. We could do more things. We were more experienced, but we were less naive. You develop, you become a different person. Yeah. And nevertheless, you have to accept that, what you've done, and to take it further. You refer to it as being a bit like a, a city, that you have the, the square and the tower. So I guess in a way, it's a kind of urbanism, isn't it, to Absolutely. carry on a building like this? Absolutely. We really love to use the enormous energy that was lying within the, this given industrial structure, mm. structure by the Giles uh, Scott, Scott building. And I think even the new one um, has kind of a spirit that mm -hmm. is very mindful of, mm -hmm. of the former power station. The way you've chosen to articulate it with this brick veil and the, the folds, it emphasizes the, the height, but it's a, quite a soft way of building in a yeah. way, isn't it? You, you talk about it as knitwear. Yeah. Yes, that was very important to have this soft moment, but also the, the, the robustness. When you mm -hmm. look in this floor, you see these concrete trusses, which are very powerful. Also, the, mo the notion of a monument, it has some monumental scale, but never should it be overwhelming. We always try our best to also provide intimate spaces, like in nature, under a tree, you know, that gives you a feeling of being protected and not exposed and overwhelmed by, by um, standing in awe in front of, I don't know, some kind of religious monumentality. That was never, of course, the plan. You see the bricks outside here, out the window. Your original plans were glass, actually, when there was a glass tower, and then you switched to brick. But you talk about the brick as a, as a fabric, as a, as a veil. Yeah, I think that now that once look, one looks through and sees it from outside and from inside, I'm pretty happy that we made this change from glass, which would, which, which would have been a material much closer to the business world outside. Yeah. And clearly the Tate now makes for one site, one coherent site, where the old parts and the new parts integrate into one thing. With the old building, the power station, the way it addressed London was kind of curious because it was a blank wall to the river and a blank wall to Southwark. This changes that orientation and makes it much more open, doesn't it, as well? So Southwark and the Thames and uh, central London will be connected. and. Uh, the Tate makes for a walkthrough. You can even walk through the Tate, yeah. which is a major museum, just as a normal passerby. Mm. You know, you walk through it like through a piece of city. Yeah. I think that's certainly part of the success of the Tate. It's open for everybody. Yeah.
Well, here we are on level five. We can see the old power station behind us. I guess the obvious uh, place to start is this is such a huge building. Why did you need to extend? Well, we have five million visitors a year. We were expecting two. Anyone who's been here on a weekend will know that the place is crowded with visitors. We've also had a, got a growing collection, and it's a collection which is now stretching across the world, not just north, northwest Europe and North America, not just British art, but looking at Africa, Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and we need space to show it. What does the new building give you that the old one couldn't? What do you gain here? So we gain space. We also gain a great variety of spaces. So they range from the tank spaces in the basement that were originally the place where the power station stored oil, raw, rough, concrete line spaces in which we can do performance and installation, to very refined gallery spaces on three levels, equivalent to the three levels in the original boiler house. You'll get a different sensation according to which part of the building you're in, which galleries you're in, and they'll be usable for different kinds of art. I think our whole idea about what can happen in a museum was changed by Tate Modern, and now we're going to have an opportunity to demonstrate just how rich those opportunities are. Cleve West, who's twice won Chelsea's top award of Best in Show, comes from a background in sculpture and structure. He rates hard landscaping as so important, he's even considered forgetting the plants altogether. 